therefore, if you allow to extend to you uh, that into which I was born, my parents before me, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, all of us born and grown up here in Virginia, and that is what we still refer to as the unwritten code of Virginia hospitality. That welcomes anyone on the road to come visit whenever they choose, stay as long as you choose, or share meals, spend the night. That's no different here at El Monticello, and so it is that I welcome you. So recently, guys, I was on vacation, took a trip out to the East Coast, specifically out to Washington, D.C. If you guys saw my uh, my YouTube short that I recently did, you'll have seen that I did it from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And if you watch that short, then you know what this episode is all about, unless, of course, you've read the title in which... You already know where, where we're going with this. But yes, during my time in D.C., I also took a trip out to the mountains of Virginia to hang out with some friends, but also to make a very, very specific stop at a home that's rather important. To American history. Now, if you want to take this trip as well, I would recommend that you start up your car and take this trip on the ground. Make a road trip out of it. I mean, you could fly, sure, and you could see the uh, the, the grandness of the uh, of the place you're visiting from the air, but to see it from the ground, I think gives you a slightly better perspective. Personally, I think that taking this trip to where we're headed today from the ground, from the road, helps to provide just a little bit of understanding as to how they might have seen it. And by those, of course, I mean those who ventured to, or lived at, or were enslaved at a home near Charlottesville, Virginia. A grand home which sits upon thousands and thousands of acres. Ladies and gentlemen, I of course am referring to the home of our third president, Thomas Jefferson, known as Monticello. <laughs> Walking up to the home is meant to awe. Monticello, which means little mountain in Italian, is no small feat. Designed by Jefferson and built by enslaved people, the house was meant to serve as a symbol of Jefferson's boundless curiosity, his intellect, and his social status. He was also, among many other things, an architect. He designed this house himself, uh, and it took about 40 years to build, uh, though he's not waiting 40 years to uh, move in. He is living here uh, throughout his life. Uh, but we are showing the house as it would have looked in its final form in his retirement years. Uh, construction was completed in 1809. That's the same year Thomas Jefferson left the presidency. Uh, he had had a very long political career serving as a member of both the Virginia legislature and the Continental Congress. He was governor of Virginia, ambassador to France, first secretary of state and second vice president before becoming president himself uh, in 1801. Served so for two terms in office. Uh, during that time, he'll double the size of the country through the purchase of the Louisiana Territory, and he will oversee the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which reaches the Pacific Ocean and back. But his presidency was not all exploration uh, and science. It was, uh, as Jefferson described it, a splendid misery uh, that resulted in a daily loss of friends. So he was quite happy to come back home uh, to Monticello and leave politics behind. Uh, by that point, this plantation had grown to be about 5,000 acres of land, most of it kind of off in that direction. Over the course of his lifetime, Jefferson enslaved over 600 uh, men, women, and children. Uh, they planted and harvested the cash crops of wheat and tobacco. They were the ones who built the house, and they served members of the Jefferson family directly. And there were a lot of members of the Jefferson family. He lived here with sometimes as many as two dozen family members at a time. But the one person who's not with him in these later years is his wife. Martha Whale Skelton Jefferson had died back in 1782 from complications due to childbirth. Uh, and uh, the Jeffersons had six children together. Only one of those children by 1809 was still living, Martha Jefferson Randolph. Uh, but Jefferson had four other surviving children with a woman named Sally Hemings, uh, and they were raised as part of the enslaved community with their mother. Uh, Sally Hemings's quarters are underneath the terrace on that side of the house, so you're certainly welcome to explore those spaces after your tour. This is also the whole, uh, Jefferson's final resting place. He died on July 4th, 1826, 50th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. So you're in a perfect place to uh, explore uh, uh, and learn more about Jefferson and his time. As you go in, watch your step, a little bit of a ledge here, and please make sure your masks are back on before you get inside. You can only imagine 
the days and nights that were spent here by the author of the Declaration of Independence, you can almost see him sitting in his library, engrossed in deep thought regarding philosophy, math, or agriculture. You can visualize him hosting guests in his sitting room and engaging in hours of conversation. You can almost hear the music that would be played and the dances being danced during grand parties. Because this was Jefferson's goal, guys, to provide a definition of what American life could be like. By incorporating elements of other cultures, whether it was French cooking, English literature, or native tapestry, Jefferson used these to forge a meaning of what it meant to live as someone called an American, to create a brand new identity for all to see and admire. And this is what you see in the mansion, rooms upon rooms of Jefferson's American ideal. But this is only one part of Monticello. As you leave the house and you make your way down a small walkway, you come to the workspaces and the living spaces, which also serve as a foundation for Monticello, the spaces of the enslaved. And let me just say, the historians at Monticello have done an excellent job of bringing the lives of those who were enslaved to Jefferson's Little Mountain front and center for all to see. Visiting these spaces, you're able to read at great length what life was like for those who built and ran the home of the polymath. Now, while Sally Hemings certainly gets much of the attention, having had six of Jefferson's children and a life that has been frequently studied, we are also offered stories of others who lived, worked, and tried to find their freedom. Like the story of James Hubbard, an enslaved man who made nails at Monticello and spent his nights making charcoal in order to earn additional money to try to buy his freedom. Jobs. So Hubbard uh, saved money and he bought a very nice suit of clothes. He had money for the road. Of course, he wants to go north through Washington and then further north. But he did not know how to read and write. And he needed a legal document saying his owner had freed them, him, called the manumission paper. So he struck a deal with the overseer's son, paid that kid to forge his manumission paper. And once he had that document, one night he took all his things and he started walking toward Washington. Well, that's 120 miles about. Almost got there. Do you know Alexandria, Virginia? He made it that far, he was stopped by the jailer who didn't know him and said, who are you? Show me your paper, your identity. Hubbard showed the man his manumission paper and Hubbard was terrified because he was immediately thrown in leg irons and thrown in jail. What had gone so wrong, we now know, because James Hubbard couldn't read and write, he didn't realize the boy who forged his paper could not read or write either. Oh. That kid must have made some letters that looked like writing. Uh, the jailer called it absolute nonsense. So without the power of reading, he was caught. And Jefferson's famous line is, knowledge is power, safety, and happiness. Hubbard didn't have those things without that knowledge. Went back to where he's caught, brought back to Monticello, makes nails for a few more years, burns charcoal at night, saves money. You know where I'm going with this? <laughs> Mid-20s, he ran away again. Uh, Jefferson's furious, bounty hunters looking for him. A year later, he's caught near Lexington, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Jefferson's lost all patience with him. He wrote in a letter that he had Hubbard flogged in the presence of his old companions. Mm -hmm. And then what Jefferson typically does with, in his words, people who are not cooperating, he had him sold. To me, the appeal of visiting a place like Monticello is that it can leave you conflicted, but that's okay. How should we think about the third president of the United States, someone who wrote that all men are created equal while never selling the people he enslaved in order to pay off his debts to creditors? Jefferson, of course, will have his diehard fans who see no fault in the Sage of Monticello. He will also undoubtedly have plenty who dismiss him for being a slave owner. But I can only hope that for most, Monticello is a place where, like how it should be in U.S. history classrooms, debate and discussion are welcomed. A place where you're allowed to explore your contradictory feelings about a man who doubled the size of the nation while only freeing 10 of the 600 people enslaved on his estate. Because that's the best part of history, everyone. 
being able to question, investigate, and understand an ever-changing story. Because education provides us the facts. We know the facts. We know they don't happen overnight. We know they take a millennium century to build one upon the other. For what purpose? To improve the condition of mankind. That's what education helps us to understand and to realize and to help us move forward to follow truth wherever it should lead us. No one will ever be able to pull the wall of ignorance over your eyes to a mistrust of your own vision. And you've had that advantage, that privilege of an education and I consider it a birthright. And that, my friends, is it for this episode of US 101. I do apologize for the delay in releasing this episode, but uh, I got the footage from Monticello, and then I had an extra week of vacation where I spent some time with family and friends in New Jersey. And, you know, you want to spend time on your vacation, you really don't want to work. You know, I'm you get caught up in things. You know what I'm talking about. Ever happened to you? Happened to me. But I do hope you enjoyed this episode, and I do hope that this episode inspired you to go and see Monticello at some point in time, and to also go see the homes of other presidents, George Washington, James Madison, Andrew Jackson, and seeing these homes offers us an opportunity to, to really dive not just into the history of those men, but also into the history of the time surrounding these men, who were living during these times, what was important to them during these times, why did they act the way they acted during these times. So I hope you guys do get an opportunity to go check out Monticello, and hopefully this is the episode that uh, gets you going out to, uh, out to the state of Virginia. Thank you guys so much for watching, really do appreciate it, and thanks to all of you that have uh, Subscribe to the channel, checked out the videos, left a like, left a comment. All that fun stuff helps to uh, helps to grow the channel. So thank you for that. As always, guys, you can follow US101 on Twitter, on Instagram, on the social medias, all those links down below in the description box. Guys, I'll see you next week for an all-new episode of US101. Until then, I am all done. Do yourselves a favor. Um, any place that I end up living during my lifetime, I hope that no one ever gives tours of them because they were all... <laughs> <laughs> They're all just apartments. It, it would, the, the tour would take you all of two minutes to see how I live. And you wouldn't be very impressed.